<clears throat> well, hello again. I'm glad you're still here. I can feel that the temperature has risen. I can see that the windows have opened, <laughs> all of which is good. And um, I'm glad to be back uh, to introduce the MSC and the mark in uh, sustainable environmental design. Um, <clears throat> Like design and make, we deal with uh, real life problems that uh, affect buildings and cities around the world. Um, we look at different climates, different cities. Wherever we look, we see that buildings are hot. Like this building is very hot at this moment, especially this room. We emit something like 10 kilowatts of heat. And buildings are warm whether we are heating them or cooling them they are warm for the city they are like giant heating devices for the city and um, you don't need to be a climate scientist to realize that that has an effect on the city and, the, and our cities have become an epicenter of climate change and urban morphology has become an unpredictable cause of fragmentation uh, of the microclimates of the city. And so, <clears throat> finding a symbiotic relationship between the building and the city is our main agenda, refurbishing the city, <clears throat> our project agenda for the last five years, looking at alternatives to global architecture and brute force engineering, which are still the norm in most uh, cities around the world. As the key objectives are very simple. We want to be able to improve the outdoor environmental conditions in cities because they also allow us uh, to do things with our buildings, to improve our buildings. We want to have independence from non-renewable energy sources for the buildings and we want to use the concepts that allow us to do these things to develop an environmentally sustainable and sensitive architecture. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> in the first two terms, London is a very convenient laboratory because we do want to go around the city and measure, observe, um, and simulate, and then be able to test the results of these. And so London acts as uh, the laboratory uh, for these. I'll come back to that. And our research methods combine observation, on-site observation and measurement, physical measurement of environmental variables that give us uh, the empirical data that we can use to calibrate um, <coughs> computational tools to undertake modeling and simulation, which then allows us to ask and answer uh, design research questions. What if I change this? What if I change that? Um, and so from simple observations of how outdoor conditions vary in a given location that we would translate into uh, fundamental architectural concepts for relating to climate, we would then proceed with uh, simulating even before we have a building, especially before we have a building, to then develop the design proposals and be able to ascertain what kind of conditions uh, will be um, arising in them and um, how well these conditions uh, will serve the occupants. The occupant is at the center of our approach to architecture, which is from inside uh, to outside. I can see here some images that represent this and with the environmental conditions and that come from the simulation results uh, superimposed on the uh, renderings. And so it's about an adaptive architecture. You can't have a static architecture that is able to respond. It won't be able to respond to climatic variations. It won't be able to respond to variations in activity uh, coming from the occupants. We need an adaptive architecture. And then we need to be able to modify that and, and to know how to do so. And so we need new knowledge. Um, and um, the, the field of environmental design is huge. There's more publication um, than in any other field at this moment. And with 
there is no way in which we can try to cover everything. That even if we did, it would be extremely superficial and possibly useless. So we <coughs> focus on buildings and on their relationship with the city, as I said before, and we try to bring in very quickly uh, an amount of knowledge that is sufficient for our students to be able to go out uh, and look at the city and look at the buildings and be able to come back with useful information that helps them to design better buildings. So very roughly in the first two terms, these are the, um, uh, the various inputs from a uh, taught course, oops, I'm sorry about this, that uh, feed into the studio uh, which uh, essentially runs with two team projects. The first term team project takes us out into London and looking at some interesting buildings that become case studies of precedence. Essentially, this is what can cities, what can buildings tell us? And in the second term, we have to reply what can we tell back in terms of being able to propose meaningful designs. So these are the two key projects around which comes all the input um, of the thought program. And just very uh, quickly to give you an illustration of that is a, like one of the case studies at Central St. Giles, a, a building very near uh, here, which um, was studied in the first term uh, over two years. And typically we would go on the site and look at the site itself, the gray are the buildings, the colors are the results of uh, measurements, in this case of uh, uh, wind velocity. And uh, here, the um, <coughs> air temperatures, and here we have surface temperatures and illuminance levels. And the combined effect of these uh, tells us about the environmental conditions on the site and, and how different people um, walking across the site uh, might feel as they do so, depending also on what they're wearing and on what they're doing. And by looking at this and also at the way in which the architects and the engineers of the building describe their intentions, then we're learning both about where they succeed and where they fail and the kind of questions that they leave. Uh, here, for example, the very tall building center point um, is seen by the students as a potential uh, turbulence effect on, on the wind conditions around the site. Um, the architects and engineers have claimed that there isn't, and, and in fact they are right, uh, because that turbulence bypasses the scheme. Uh, similarly, we can look at the solar effects on the site, um, whether, for example, that courtyard um, is a recipient of uh, solar direct sun at certain times. Uh, it's not very easy in London, as you will discover, to have direct sun uh, in, a, in a courtyard just because the sun uh, rays are fairly low. So when you do, uh, it's really very good. And then uh, the next thing is to wait, of course, for a sunny day uh, because uh, not every day is sunny. You will have seen that as well. And, uh, and then you can find out whether you know, these two uh, come together and uh, indeed there is a sunny spot where you can sit for more than uh, five minutes. In fact, if that is the case, then you are a very happy person. And, um, and so we look for that and we, we are prepared to go into as much detail as necessary. And, and then from, from, from the site, uh, then going into the building, the, the building has, is a mixed-use building as commercial um, restaurants and so forth at ground floor. Um, offices and then residential and um, uh, here's one unit and it, it's quite incredible that you can look at just one dwelling unit and, 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 and find things that can be generalized to the whole building and in fact to many other buildings. Uh, that's quite incredible and I think extremely powerful. The generalization capability which of course is fundamental in architecture <coughs> provided you know what to look for and where to find it. <coughs> and, and, and here we take the basic measurements and uh, of course we, we're not trying to be uh, scientists, uh, they're just uh, trying to combine the observations that we will have done as architects 
with uh, numerical evaluations of certain conditions which uh, slowly but surely the students start to begin to be able to understand and explore. And it's very interesting to see the differences. So you can see that outdoor temperature is 15.7, and, and inside this flat, which, which is not mechanically controlled at this moment, uh, we have this variation in temperatures, and, and, the, and that they are so high. And, uh, and, and that could be, of course, should be a mystery uh, at the beginning for the students. What, what, what makes the temperature go up there? And um, um, hopefully then that makes them quite interested in finding out. We have similar variations, in fact, much stronger ones, and illuminance levels from something like 1,400 lux close to the window to a few meters back. It drops down to being really very dark. And again, why is this happening? Uh, <clears throat> is it the window size? Is it the uh, form of the room? Is it the furniture? Is it a combination of these? Uh, these are important things to find out. And um, we, we use, as I already said, we use the measurements to calibrate, uh, model, and then simulate. And, 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 and here we see a thermal, the result of a thermal simulation where the, the blue line is the um, uh, temperature that was measured, and the green line is the simulation using a dynamic thermal simulation software, and the pink band being the comfort band. Uh, so it's late <coughs> October, and um, the temperatures are as high as you remember to have <coughs> seen them, and <coughs> as they are showed here. And essentially, here we have a good uh, agreement uh, between measurement and simulation. In fact, the measurement is at the average of the simulated, and the simulated are uh, spiky like that, very simply because the occupancy data that we put are quite abrupt. Um, it, it means that the students didn't spend enough time uh, making it smoother in terms of, you know, jump out of bed, everybody does that at the same moment, everybody switches the coffee machine and so forth. And, 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 and so that is another uh, situation in which we learn about these differences, what affects them, and uh, how the building reacts compared to the way the outdoor air temperature uh, varies, which is there, and, and the way the solar radiation uh, does. And, and then we're, we're free to ask and try to answer questions about how this building might have been if it had been designed by you, therefore better than what the architects have managed uh, to do. Um, and, and similarly, we can look at the uh, office side of things. And there, perhaps, it's not so much the thermal aspects that we might be interested as the, the lighting, and then spend more time looking at the way in which uh, daylight um, operates within, is admitted and operates within the space, and, um, and, and how it's distributed, and whether there are ways in which this could have been done uh, better in terms of both the quantity and uh, also the quality of the daylight. So then, equipped with this knowledge, <coughs> which becomes a starting point in, in terms of having these ideas from um, the case studies of the first term of things that have seemed to have worked in that building uh, well, and things which uh, paradoxically didn't, and why didn't they, and having hypotheses about that, then we can um, try our hand at designs of our own, um, finding a site, doing preliminary analytic work, because we can hypothesize the building before it exists um, <coughs> quite easily by simulation. And in fact, that is much more helpful than starting to simulate after we have the design, because then we're simply trying to corroborate what we already think is a good design. But why should we have had a good design if we didn't know how to do it? <coughs> and then form finding based on this analytic work, designing the form and its components and so forth to the um, <coughs> final result. These um, two projects um, <coughs> complete what we call phase one of, uh, 
of the MSC and the MARC. And then we come to the um, phase two, which is the dissertation project. That's quite different uh, for the MSC and, and the MARC. <coughs> And where, again, we can continue to have collective agendas, but increasingly in our case, uh, there are individual as, uh, uh, agendas because both the MARC and the MSC dissertations are done individually. And, and where a great variety of building types, climates, urban context, design issues emerge. You saw in one of my, <coughs> on one of my first slides uh, 350 projects in 70 cities, 40 countries, and many different climates. And there are the re re recurrent themes that cut across some of the differences, like for example the, the theme of the urban block, whether this is in Denver, Colorado, is this one, or in Athens, Greece. And the, and the ways in which the urban block might be addressed at, at different times by uh, different individuals for uh, different reasons. So here, the urban block is just a parking lot at the moment, so there is the opportunity to uh, um, develop it from scratch. And, and the student finds strong inspiration from strong geometry that um, these tilts can be seen as, on the one hand, inviting the sun, and on the other hand, avoiding the sun, and are represented also um, <clears throat> organically by the functions that um, uh, those uh, parts of the building uh, serve. So therefore, the difference between, let's say, residential, uh, more sun-seeking, and commercial, uh, avoiding the sun <clears throat> to avoid overheating. And this is the result from the simple fundamental assumptions. In Athens, uh, the um, 1960s and 1970s have built the whole city. So there isn't an empty urban block, but there are many uh, thousand urban blocks and um, many problems that result from the way in which they're used. <coughs> and here we have a few days in June. June is not necessarily the warmest month yet, but uh, the temperature is rising in, in, in the center quite significantly. In fact, seven degrees higher than the suburbs and, and the area of the new airport. Uh, and, and, and this is quite significant. And, uh, and it's telling us about the fact that the climate has changed here uh, and, and is very different to this and that's during daytime. Uh, and there is more of a problem because it also like that at night. And uh, the, the nighttime temperature, which is quite low here, w would have helped to cool the buildings, but it's no longer available um, as we move towards the center. So the, this is the bad news. The good news is, of course, that still near the city is a climate which is like that. And, and the question becomes whether then we can return the center in similar condition, because that was a very nice climate. This is why Athens is where it is. Um, <clears throat> so that becomes an interesting starting point. And um, so <clears throat> a lot of work that has taken place over the years, this is from um, the, the last um, set of dissertations that focused on the urban environment of Athens, where a walk is start to, starting to tell us the, the differences that uh, manifest themselves across a section of uh, a city. Uh, we can then focus on an urban block and start measuring, uh, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, um, the, the numbers you see measure the uh, air temperature and also surface temperatures. And uh, so you see how it builds up very quickly, and the roofs especially, which uh, are exposed to solar radiation more than the um, elevations. And then a drop that starts um, at night, uh, usually not sufficient to let the buildings uh, cool down uh, significantly uh, during nighttime so that they're cool in the morning. 
Um, well, with the, this kind of measurements, as I've already mentioned, we are in, in a position to uh, model and, um, and, and start raising questions about, th these are the urban blocks now, it's a whole series of nine urban blocks, um, and th these are sections. Uh, <clears throat> and, and here we can do a simulation of the urban microclimate, <clears throat> predicting temperatures and other uh, fundamental uh, parameters, and ask questions about whether, for example, adding green, lifting the buildings on pilotis, uh, etc., might um, improve the conditions, which is you know, what you see uh, here, and then start to speculate about how we might express the findings at, at, the, at the ground level, um, inside the, the, the blocks, uh, on the street, and also uh, on the roofs, which um, <coughs> become a very important aspect. I mean, the roofs of cities, of big cities like that, are black. They are black and absorb solar radiation, but they don't know what to do with that solar radiation. So essentially what, what happens is a black canopy is created above the city and uh, prevents uh, dissipation of heat from it. So something which could have been very creative, the solar radiation coming to the city, becomes part of its problem. And similarly, we can look at the built form itself uh, and, uh, and start shaping it based on, on simple rules that uh, um, are the result of observations, measurements, simulations, and of, um, uh, and, and of real buildings that um, we have appreciated. So we see another uh, study, this is now on the form of um, an office building in a Mediterranean uh, climate where the, the depth of the building becomes one of the parameters, the openings that are needed where the depth uh, would become critical is, is another. And the way in which the section can be made adaptive and perhaps the building can be opened or closed and the adaptive measures can be varied by occupants or automatically. Uh, these become part of our investigations. But many of our students come from warm climates and uh, the, 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 there isn't any worse architecture than the conventional architecture that appears in, in the tropics. It's trapping the heat and demanding huge amounts of air conditioning to, to provide basic conditions that are not even comfortable. And so the, the question of an architecture for the tropics is a very important one for us. And there's magnificent inspiration uh, from the tradition there, from the vernacular architecture, which has uh, worked inspirationally and generatively for several of our students. I'll give you some examples very uh, quickly. Um, but one of the fundamental things, it, it, it's, it's not a difficult climate to deal with, the, 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 the tropical climate that's essentially warm and humid. Um, <clears throat> neither, in fact, too warm nor too humid. But there is enough warmth and humidity to demand uh, certain characteristics that, of solar protection and of permeability to airflow, which are fundamental and therefore have an important effect on the plan and the section. They have, these have to be taken into account. Otherwise you have a trap, you have a... Uh, and so this shows how uh, this particular project has dealt with these uh, principles. And we see some of the tests are done and, and the end product. Uh, so that there is the inspiration from the tradition. It's not an imitation in any way. And, and we have a, a novel expression um, the, the other characteristic that we see in this climate is the transitions that we can, that we can bring from the outdoor to the indoor. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that slowly but surely we can dispose of glass, which is an expensive material and, and which is a problem material for, for this climate, replacing it now with screen-like entities, uh, some of which fixed and some uh, mobile. You can see here another project um, self-built for um, social housing in Ecuador. 
But from time to time, there's uh, an interest in, in um, working with materials. Uh, in fact, in getting hands dirty with materials. Um, I don't think we're necessarily very good at it, but um, um, some students do become enthusiastic, and it's very important to let them get on with it. And this particular team was very interested to mix concrete with straw, so they uh, got this strawcrete. This is what they called it, as a strawcrete. And, um, and um, engaged in really testing this. And, uh, and it did give reasonable um, thermal and structural uh, properties. And they did get their hands dirty. Yeah, but we didn't build anything with it. It was just a laboratory experiment. Um, <clears throat> more exciting, <clears throat> perhaps a bit more high tech, was this the phase change materials. Um, allow allow us to manipulate uh, energy conditions in a space because they can they can change phase from solid to liquid and and vice versa and in the process release energy so they can store and release energy and, and that can be somehow programmed and therefore uh, we can have good uh, results from this now that in itself is no big deal but in this particular case we uh, also have translucence and transparency and so instead of having this material on the wall where it would be acting as a heat store we can have it on the window where it can act as solar protection and hopefully and this was the expectation here also as an architectural effect as you can see uh, and uh, there, there we are now it becoming more transparent and and different stages well it, it didn't work exactly as uh, uh, as one would have liked. It's no fault of the student or of ours. It's, uh, this is high-tech stuff and the companies producing it should um, um, try to develop it more. And there are special issues that come into play. So here we have another example of uh, tropical ar architecture, in fact rather equatorial, because we're in the Amazon region of Brazil, very close to the equator, and uh, a, a, a very uh, ambitious concept by this student to, to, to develop a network of research stations uh, fed and um, uh, powered by these boats that would move from one to another that uh, uh, deals with research uh, across the uh, Amazonian region. Uh, so it's being an equatorial uh, sort of location, we have a, an overhead sun and, and therefore the building becomes by definition, very roof-like, you know, low-rise roof-like. So it's for its solar protection, and um, and then very permeable uh, to air, uh, for to avoid um, <coughs> trapping the heat, and to allow the the wind to come in. So you can see that the shape is given by those and becomes an interesting shape by following these environmental uh, factors we see here. Uh, an airflow simulation using uh, computational fluid dynamics, and the boats follow the same the same principle of uh, solar protection and permeability. Uh, I have um, not looked at the watch when I started. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I know I should be finishing. Um, <clears throat> so you can see more projects uh, on on the school's website. There's a uh, projects that, um, these here are projects that uh, were uploaded for the um, last June's projects review exhibition. And, and then from Monday, we will also have a series of posters uh, <coughs> and, and books uh, of projects in our phase one studio at 16 Morwell Street, first floor. Now, um, we have 17 continuing a mark um, projects, it's a mark phase two, as uh, the students have just returned now from the reflection period, and uh, uh, they are listed in this big map of projects, and there will be opportunity uh, to, see the, to see their work uh, during the term, and, and of course at the uh, showcase that uh, will be held in uh, January, on the 21st of January. Publications, we're very keen to publish work. And, uh, and there is a lot of demand uh, for it, as we have a section here uh, in, in this book, Green Design from 
a theory to practice that was edited by Ken Young. Uh, we have uh, an article here with projects in um, this special issue of architectural design, experimental green strategies. We um, have um, several articles and papers that we, both students and staff, presented at the PLEA 2013 conference in Munich that was held just three weeks ago. Um, I have two books on which we have articles that are quite important, Architecture and Energy, just published um, in May, Lessons from Vernacular Architecture, uh, published um, uh, a month ago. Um, tomorrow I'll be flying to Napoli in Italy uh, to, um, as a keynote speaker to this conference of the European Network of Heads of Schools of Architecture, and uh, which, which I find extremely important because here we are the, the Heads of Schools of Architecture around Europe organizing this particular conference on how to teach environmental design in architectural education, which I find really, I have things I can tell them uh, about that. Um, and this will be the big event for, for our students in the coming year. There's the Player Conference, Passive and Low Energy Architecture, a, a series of conferences with which we have been associated for a long time, is meeting in Ahmedabad in India uh, in December 2014, ideally placed for work that takes place this academic year to be presented uh, on the theme of sustainable habitat for developing societies. More, more on this to come. I have to speed now. Okay, so now I'm talking just to the uh, students who've come to join uh, Sustainable Environmental Design. Um, <coughs> tomorrow uh, you're introducing uh, yourselves to each other and here are the instructions uh, which I think I've emailed uh, probably. Um, <coughs> we'll find out. Ten slides in uh, seven minutes. The room is this one. You come through number 36, you go up, cross the terrace, and there. In fact, you will know this room because you will be doing drinks tonight, uh, but in case, in case you overdo the drinks, uh, and you might not remember, um, perhaps we'll find some of you there anyway in the morning. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is where it is. This is how you unlock the door in case uh, it has been locked. And, and this is you. And now the important ones are the first six. Georgina, where? Georgina? Uh, there she is. Okay, that's good. So there you first. And um, <laughs> it's good to know, isn't it? Yeah. So then the first six, uh, that, that's, it's only, it's not just Georgina, but Larissa? Can't see, her. oh there, there, yeah. Han? Yeah, no, they're all here, it's good. So the first six to be there a bit earlier to fix things, and of course we'll be there to help you. Good, and, and then by the end of the day, we will have teams, project teams, and we will start this design charrette <laughs> Uh, the, the topic will be announced tomorrow after uh, the presentations. The charrette will last until Monday. Monday we have presentations of the charrette and after those we will introduce the events of term one. I'm not introducing them now because not everybody will be attending those. So we will introduce those to those of you who are joining the program. Um, then our Term 1 lecture courses start on Tuesday at 11.30. A Term 1 project, which will be a team project that looks at some schemes around London, will be um, <clears throat> starting on Tuesday afternoon. We will introduce our instrumentation and computation tools course on Wednesday, and, and this uh, will be followed immediately with London Walks using the instruments. And um, this is the timetable for the rest of the term. I was just talking about things that happen here. Um, this will be circulated on, on, on Monday. And the program guide um, will be distributed uh, tomorrow. We have a program guide that gives much more detail about the program, um, lists, projects, and so forth. 
and um, and so you saw me, but um, there's uh, <coughs> a group of colleagues here. Uh, Paola Kadima is uh, sitting there in the first row wearing red, and Byron has a big beard and is sitting there, and the others, you will uh, meet them soon. Okay, I think I've done longer, uh, so I apologize and thank you.